Man, what a shit week. I mean, first we have all those WWE superstars and personnel fired, laid off, furloughed, what have you, on Wednesday. We then come to find out the very next day, the first thing on Thursday morning, that Howard Finkel passed away. And then I come to find out today, via Fightful, that Jinder Mahal is on his way back to the company and is clear to compete, is merely waiting for the creative team to bring him back. I'm just kidding on that last one, but overall, it really has not been the best week for wrestling fans. Uh, between all the firings this week and Howard Finkel passing away, those two things alone, very depressing. Not the biggest gender fan myself, but at least he still has a job, so um, that that is pretty good, if nothing else. Don't want to see the guy get fired, I just have no desire to see him back on Raw. Though I will say, a Jinder Mahal versus Drew McIntyre feud simply writes itself, and how can you do that feud without at some point mentioning that Heath Slater is also part of 3MB, he was also let go, he has to fulfill the destiny of going out on his own, being gone for a few years, you know, returning in two, three years from now and becoming the next WWE champion. Still waiting on that to happen, but in the meantime, guys, we are talking Friday Night Smackdown from Friday, April 17th, 2020 here today. I am Graham G. S. Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well. Overall, I will say I don't want to say this was a great show. Um, this was the... I don't even know, the uh, third or fourth, maybe consecutive week, I did not watch the show live. Now, it would help my cause if I watched the show live. It would help me get this review done faster, get the uh, you know the video up sooner and whatnot. But overall, I really just don't feel the need to want to watch SmackDown Live. The fact that it airs on Fridays doesn't help. But, you know, as a kid, it was cool because, oh, Friday's end of the week, done with school, time for the weekend, blah, blah, blah. As you get older, not that I'm an incredibly busy person socially anyway, but you want to be able to do other things, and, you know, obviously there was nowhere to go right now, but that didn't stop me from watching the Mauro Ronaldo documentary from Showtime on Friday Night with Alexis, which was absolutely incredible. You can watch it for free. I would recommend you watch that over this, to be honest with you. Not this video. Watch this video, of course. But I'm talking about SmackDown. Uh, watch the Mauro Ronaldo documentary from 2018. It's actually available for uh, for free right here on YouTube if you want to check it out via the Showtime um, YouTube channel. It was really really good. I've had it my watch later uh, my watch later playlist for a long time now, and I finally had a chance to check it out on Friday. I'm like, you know, fuck SmackDown. I'll watch it after, and I'm glad I did because I thought the Marinalo doc was great. SmackDown on the whole wasn't terrible. I will say it was a bit better than usual. And yeah, some stuff happened, like they had some qualifiers for Money in the Bank and some other stuff. Just on the whole, I really don't care about the SmackDown creative direction. Now, I thought the stuff with Mandy, Otis, Dolph, and Sonya was great. I thought that was really, really good. I thought the Daniel Bryan-Cesaro match was awesome. I thought the main event was good. A bit of a questionable title change, which I'll get to. Um, But overall, I'm just really not digging SmackDown, and I know I'm not alone. The fact that it airs on Fridays is one thing. The other thing is that the creative direction just sucks. So until that improves, I really do not see a desire. I really do not have much of a desire or see a point in watching the show live at all. Doesn't feel must see. Nothing of too much note ever really happens. And they have a good roster. So that that's kind of a shame that I don't really feel the need right now, the same way I do with Raw most weeks, to want to watch the show live. Uh, But this was SmackDown for April 17th, 2020, as I said earlier. Um, It is worth noting before we get started here, there was a report, I believe from Dave Meltzer, either yesterday or Thursday, indicating that WWE commentators, you know, on-air superstars, whatever, were actually instructed, there was an edict out there from the WWE personnel, whatever, the the higher-ups, that Roman Reigns' name is not to be mentioned on WWE TV. Now, That has sparked a lot of speculation. Is he in hot water with the company after walking out on WrestleMania for very justified reasons, by the way? The thing is, I read that, I really don't put too much faith in that report. Just because, not to say that it's not true, but that doesn't really mean to me anything negative. Because why would you bring up Roman Reigns anyway? In what sense would you have to mention Roman Reigns' name on TV? It's not like, oh, you know, we have to completely forget that Roman Reigns even exists, we have to give him the Chris Benoit treatment, he never worked here, erase his name from the website, blah blah blah, the opening video. As far as I know, he's still in the opening video for SmackDown, 
He's still the face of that show. He's all over the website for SmackDown's branding. He was a part of the WrestleMania video package, which I know was made a while ago, but if they really wanted to, because this company can be petty, they could have gone out of their way to erase him from that video package in the opening for both nights of WrestleMania. The bottom line is, they didn't do any of those things. So he will be back. And why would they mention it? Why would they mention Roman Reigns in any situation right now? He has nothing to do with anything going on. Goldberg isn't around. It would be one thing if Goldberg was still around, still a champion, and he came out and said, oh, I'm waiting for Roman Reigns to get back. Or like, you know, he ran away because, you know, he's scared of me, blah, blah, blah. That's it. That's the only other situation I could see his name being even acknowledged. And Goldberg's not around, so why bother? So I, I wouldn't really put too much into that for anyone saying, oh, he's being buried or he's being, you know, erased from WWE history. Like, give me a break. Uh, we did kick off the show with an episode of, not really an episode, but an installment of Moment of Bliss with Alexa Bliss, Nikki Cross, the new NXT, or rather the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. I don't know why I said NXT. And their guest was the Universal Champion, Braun Strowman. Now, I usually like the chemistry between Braun and Alexa Bliss. I would love to see, to be honest with you, some sort of a storyline between Braun and Alexa Bliss at some point. The same way that they finally acknowledge the chemistry between Otis and Mandy, not the yeah, yeah, chemistry, but I'm talking about, like, the history between the two, dating back to their NXT days. I saw that frickin' Kayla Braxton from The Bump um, said on this week's Bump, you know, she took credit for the Otis and Mandy storyline, or not really the storyline, but, you know, Mandy giving Otis a chance, which I say, you know, get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. Obviously, she didn't. They didn't spark anything. Their storyline has technically been going, per Otis himself. He was the one who really started that for four or five years at this point. It had nothing to do with The Bump, so don't get it twisted. The same way that Braun and Alexa Bliss, yeah, they were paired together, but they were the ones that really took that pairing to another level in the Mixed Match Challenge. So, I know this is a bit irrelevant to the segment they had on here, uh, they had on hand here, but it would be cool to see at some point them do something with Braun and Alexa Bliss. I mean, Braun, I like the guy as a character. He doesn't really do much for me right now. He's just big, towering giant of a man. He's the monster among men. Beyond that, there really isn't much to sink your teeth into there. They do have the history between Braun and Bray Wyatt. I like that. Other than that, though, I really do not find myself all too compelled by the character of Braun Strowman. Uh, but maybe at some point they will get back to Braun and Alexa Bliss. I noticed, for whatever reason, not too long ago, that Bliss is actually a, maybe one of three people that Braun follows on Twitter. I forgot who the other two were. Maybe one of them was Vince or the WWE Twitter account. I don't remember. But one of them is Alexa Bliss, which is very interesting. Um, I don't know if they've ever, you know, I, I know there was like rumors of them being an item. I've never seen that officially. Um, but I know they are very good friends from their Mixed Match Challenge days. And hopefully that's brought back into light at some point um, and into a WWE storyline. And unfortunately, the writer that wrote the Otis and Mandy storyline, who would have been perfect for the Braun and Alexa storyline, was laid off this past week. So maybe it's better that they hold off on that storyline for a little while. But anyway, in this segment, they showed the replays of Braun, um, you know, interacting with Bray Wyatt at the end of SmackDown last week. They then showed a present in the corner of the ring, which Braun thought was from Alexa. She denied it. He still thought it was from her. Th this whole thing was stupid. Now, the thing with the Braun and Bray Wyatt feud, I really don't mind it. I think I said this last week here in the audio review. I really don't mind it. The thing is, is that I feel like it's way too rushed. I completely agree with CM Punk from backstage on Tuesday. And I, I know I'm not the only one. He wasn't the only one who said this. I know a lot of other people feel this way. Is that it feels like more of a SummerSlam feud. I like the Bray and Braun idea. It's fresh. It's better than having Bray face something, you know, face someone he's already faced before. You know, since he became the Fiend, he's only ever really feuded with people he's already feuded with in the past. Daniel Bryan. I mean, yeah, those matches were good. But he feuded with Daniel Bryan years ago. John Cena, their memorable feud from 2014. Even Seth Rollins, he previously feuded with back in 2017. At least Braun Strowman's a guy they have never before faced off one-on-one, -on -one, to my memory anyway. I know The Fiend like attacked Braun Strowman on an episode of Raw late last year. Other than that, I cannot remember a single segment that these two have had together. Um, so I, I like the idea of the few. The issue is, who do you have when? It's obviously going to be Braun. They made the match official for the Money in the Bank pay-per-view later on in the show on Friday. But it was advertised as Braun Strowman versus Bray Wyatt, not The Fiend, which is interesting because other than the Miz match, which Bray Wyatt still won um, at TLC back in December, he has wrestled as The Fiend every single time for every pay-per-view match he's had. Both matches with Seth Rollins, both matches with Daniel Bryan, 
I, I guess, kind of the Firefly Funhouse match. I mean, he came in as the Fiend in the end, and he won as the Fiend. Uh, a majority of that match, so to speak, was as Bray Wyatt, but he was still advertised to fight as the Fiend. He's not being advertised to fight as the Fiend on this pay-per-view, which tells me Braun Strowman is holding on to the gold for at least a little bit longer, which is probably the best call. If you're going to put the belt on him, you might as well have him hold it for a little while. I know I probably said the same thing with him as Intercontinental Champion, and they took the belt off of him then for after like only a month and a half, but, you know, five or six weeks. But the only way you're going to... I, I hate to say make new stars, because I feel like Braun is so heavily damaged, he's not going to be that guy. But if you really want people to take him seriously as champion and after he drops the belt, is if you book him accordingly. He can't be going out there and losing the belt within a month. The belt is already a joke as it is. To have Bray win it and have the belt change hands for the third or fourth consecutive month, because Goldberg won it back in February, Braun won it in April, so it wasn't in March, but for like the third or fourth consecutive pay-per-view is fucking ridiculous that it was defended on. So we'll see what they do with it. Um, I thought the segment was dumb with Braun acting like, oh, he's got... He... I thought the black sheep thing was cool. Don't get me wrong. I thought the imagery of him wearing the black sheep mask from his Wyatt family days five years ago was cool. Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross, like, you know, bower, you know, backing away in fear and cowering in fear, I thought was completely ridiculous and felt forced. I like the idea of the feud, and I am looking forward to seeing them revisit their rival, not rivalry, but their history from years ago as the Wyatt family next week on SmackDown. But I am skeptical regarding what they do with the feud, come Money in the Bank, and what they do beyond Money in the Bank. Do they have Bray Wyatt lose and that's it? Do they set up a rematch for the June pay-per-view, which we still have no idea what it's going to be yet? I do not know. I guess we'll soon see. We had Tamina face Sasha Banks, where if she won here, she would earn herself an opportunity to compete for the SmackDown Women's Championship of the Money in the Bank pay-per-view against Bayley. You had to know she was winning. The timing could not be worse, because that um, uh, Jimmy Snuka, her father, that Jimmy Snuka documentary aired on Dark Side of the Ring on Tuesday on Vice, which was great, by the way. My review will be up at some point. I do, I've already recorded all the reviews for all these episodes. They just have yet to be put up here on the channel. So my review of that Jimmy Snuka episode of Dark Side of the Ring may not be up until like the end of this month, late next or early next month, whatever. It will be up at some point. I will say though, it was great, and I am absolutely of the belief that he murdered his girl for Nancy Argentino. So unfortunately, Tamina is getting the push at the wrong time. But regardless of what her father did, that has no bearing on her push or you know whatever how I feel about Tamina. That has nothing to do with it, really. To be honest with you, there is no right time for Tamina push. Because she should not be pushed. She's absolutely awful. I have yet to see one good Tamina match. Every match that she has won, if you've noticed, in the last year or so, has always involved Sasha Banks. She beat Sasha here. They had a triple threat match. I'm sorry, Sasha wasn't involved in that match. I was going to say she got pinned by, uh, Sasha got pinned by Tamina in that triple threat right before Mania, but that was actually Naomi. And then they also did... Tamina and Sasha Banks on Raw back in March of last year, and Tamina won that too. And that was right before, I think, Tamina and Nia faced uh, Sasha and Bailey for the tag team titles of Fastlane, so they had to kind of establish her as a threat, you know. Um, but she's absolutely terrible. The match sucked. There was no reason for this to last as long as it did. And Sasha, I'm not. it's not just a Barry tamina session here. Sasha wasn't all that good either. She had an off night. I'm not sure if it was because... Um, I don't know, they just didn't have chemistry, or just, Tamina's always terrible, that really doesn't change, and no matter who she's facing, but not even the great Sasha Banks could get a passable match out of Tamina on this show, this was absolutely atrocious, and I have, I have even less interest in seeing her face Bailey for the SmackDown Women's Championship at the Money in the Bank pay-per-view. Bailey really hasn't had, aside from Mania, which may have been the best title defense she's had to date, which isn't saying a lot, Although I did like the Carmella match, Bailey has not been lighting the world on, uh, you know, on fire as champion. The Nikki Cross match on SmackDown last year was alright from what I can remember. The Naomi match at Super Showdown sucked. The Lacey Evans match at the Royal Rumble match was not that good. She really is not having all those you know, the great matches as SmackDown Women's Champion. I'm sure Tamina will be no exception. So we'll soon see, but I have no desire... Less than zero desire, actually. I have negative. I have a negative amount of interest in seeing Tamina in the SmackDown Women's Championship picture. And you may be asking yourself, well, who else do you put in that spot? They're pushing Dana Brooke right now. Honestly, don't really like Tamina uh, or Dana Brooke that much more than Tamina. But at least she's better in the ring than Tamina is. And that's saying something because Dana Brooke is not all that great in her own right either. Although she did have a decent match on the show. I won't give her that. 
uh, Dana Brooke, unlike Tamina, has at least improved during her lengthy stay in WWE over the last five, six years. Tamina has been with his company for twice the amount of time as Dana Brooke and has only, honestly, regressed in that time. I have never met anyone, I have never seen a single performer that has only regressed in the ring and having been with the company for so long. No desire to see her as SmackDown Women's Champion. I really hope she doesn't win. I don't think she will win. Yes, it is a filler feud before uh, Bailey faces Sasha, likely at SummerSlam. It probably won't be happening in Boston, unfortunately. I hate to say it, because I really want to be there for it. Uh, that is likely where they're headed with this. Tamina is the wrong person for the role. Will never be the right person for that role, regardless of the time, because she's just not that good. I would rather see Dana Brooke in this spot. They can go back after the Carmella feud. I know they did it for like a week or two a few months ago, and they had a good match on SmackDown. I would be fine with them revisiting that, because at least that was good. Tamina is terrible. Call up someone from NXT if you have to. Anyone but Tamina. The next match, Sheamus knocking off Denzel DeJornet, um, who I... I was going to say I thought I talked about the um, Denzel here on the show before in the SmackDown audio review, but I actually did not. Denzel, the last time that we saw him on WWE TV, was a mere week and a half ago on the post-WrestleMania Raw against Seth Rollins. He got squashed that night. Didn't really have much of a chance to showcase his skills, nor did he have that chance here. Um, but he's a guy to look out for. He's a guy that reminds me a lot, and not just because they're both black, but of Jason Jordan, Chad Gable, people like that who have an amateur wrestling background. Maybe I'm wrong and he doesn't, but I'm pretty sure he does. He wears the singlet. I saw him on Evolve um, about a month or two ago. And I, yeah, he really reminds me of Jason Jordan, but just a lot more potential. And that's saying something, because Jason Jordan is and was really, really good. Um, but he strikes me as having more personality, just, I don't know, he, he seems like a guy that they could build around at some point in NXT. Um, he is under contract with a developmental deal in NXT, so hopefully at some point they will utilize him there and push him, and he's not just another Tahuti Miles who was out there just a job to people. Um, he has a lot more to offer than just being beat up every week, so I thought he looked fine here, but this was all about Sheamus getting squashed, or, you know, uh, Sheamus rather squashing Denzel. Uh, the match was short-lived. Purely by coincidence, Michael Cole for the second straight week just so happened to be talking about Jeff Hardy. I mean, what are the odds? Of course. Uh, Michael Cole, is start, you know, he starts talking about Jeff Hardy. They throw it to the video package of his fall in a second part series of his video, pack, uh, video package from last week. All of these clips are from his WWE 24 Woken documentary with Matt, which is amazing, by the way. It's up there as one of my favorite documentaries they've ever done. The Edge one from recently I thought was great, too, but this one may always be my favorite, if only because of my personal connection, my personal attachment to the Hardy Boys, specifically Matt. But, um, yeah, so I thought that was great, and the, the video package was really, really good. But, yeah, Michael Cole was talking about Jeff right around Sheamus again, just as Sheamus was leaving the ring, so I thought that was a little forced. But it does look like they're setting up a Sheamus and Jeff Hardy feud, which is cool. They've never done it before. The closest they came to feuding was back in 2017 when they had the bar feud with the Hardy Boys for the Raw Tag Team titles back in the spring of 2017. Had a lot of good matches. I think they actually did a Jeff hardy Sheamus match on Raw at one point, if I'm not mistaken. And from what I can recall, it was pretty good. They had, a, they had a very good series of matches that summer, those two teams. So I'm sure this will be no different. The issue is, a lot like Bray and Braun, both of these guys are coming off long layoffs and need wins right now. They need wins. And they're not going to get it facing each other. So we'll see what they have in mind for these two. And I like the idea of a feud. It's something different. It's better than doing Sheamus and Daniel Bryan for the fucking upteenth time. But at the same time, though, I feel like they would be better utilized in different spots right now. For example, I don't know if I would do Sheamus and Daniel Bryan per se. They already did Sheamus and Chad Gable, and that went absolutely nowhere. They already had Sheamus squash Apollo Crews a number of times. You know, Sheamus and Braun, I think Sheamus and Braun would have been sick, and maybe they're saving that for down the road for SummerSlam. That would be cool. If Sheamus is the one to take the belt off of Braun, I honestly would not hate it, as much as I would have like five or six years ago. Um, you know, he hasn't been in that world title picture for a long time. Sheamus looked freaking ripped right now. He looks great. So I see no issue with that. Um, they could have done Braun. Roman we've seen before, and he's not even here anyway, so it doesn't even matter. With Jeff, you could have had him feud with Sami Zayn for the Intercontinental Championship, Shinsuke Nakamura, Cesaro. He's a guy that loses all the time anyway, so why not? Um, you know, there, there's a couple different options. I don't know. There really isn't a lot of depth in either show at the moment. 
you know, I, I could, you could have split, a, you know, split apart the New Day and have Sheamus feud with them, even though we've seen that a million times. But Sheamus and Kofi could have a good series of matches. I don't know, but uh, I don't know. Sheamus and Jeff from the get go seems a little early, just because both guys need wins right now, and they're probably not going to get that facing, you know, each other, unless it's 50-50 booking. And of course, as we know, that never really benefits anybody. Our first Money in the Bank qualifier was between Dana Brooke and Naomi. Decent match. Uh, Dana Brooke wins, surprisingly. She does have a WWE Women's Tag Team title opportunity coming up next week alongside Carmella against Alexa and Nikki. So I'm kind of surprised that she won here just because Naomi's a far bigger star. I don't want to say, oh, because Dana was in it last year, she shouldn't have to be in it this year. I mean, Naomi was in it last year, too. But Naomi's a far bigger star. She's a lot better than Dana Brooke. I, re- I don't want to see Dana Brooke is Miss Money in the Bank. If that's where they're going with this, God, no, no thank you. Naomi has at least never held the briefcase. She hasn't been champion in a number of years. Dana Brooke has never been champion, but there's a good reason for that. Not everyone can be champion. Not everyone should be champion. She's just not that good. She has improved, to her credit, but she's just not that good. Naomi's a lot better. Naomi, it really amazes me, because Naomi had all this momentum when she came back. She got that big reaction to the Royal Rumble. She was, in a way, trending on Twitter. I saw a lot of people saying, oh, I don't know who this woman is. I don't follow wrestling, but I absolutely love this girl, Naomi, because she had, like, a unique look. And she was very different than your, you know, stereotypical WWE women's wrestler or diva whatever. And she's really good in the ring to boot. She's not the best they have, but she's still pretty damn good. And then they proceeded to do absolutely nothing with Naomi. She, she got pinned by Carmella in that fatal four-way number one contenders match right after the Rumble, which was bizarre. Carmella lost her title shot. Naomi ended up getting a title shot by beating Carmella, and then she lost to Bailey at the Super Showdown pay-per-view. And then she lost again at Money in the Bank, or not Money in the Bank, but rather WrestleMania. So she already lost two title opportunities, two back-to-back championship opportunities, and now she can't even make Money in the Bank. What are they doing, Naomi? If you want to put Dana Brooke in there, that's fine. Naomi, real like she would, she would look great. I was at the pay-per-view last year. I thought, I thought, um. Naomi looked awesome in that Money in the Bank ladder match. She was right in her element in that ladder match. And unless she pulls a Dakota Kai and she qualifies before, right before the pay-per-view in like a last chance type of match, I don't see her making that pay-per-view, which sucks. But yeah, Dana Brooke, they're t- not teasing tension, but like she had that weird segment with Carmella afterward where Carmella was saying, oh, you got to focus your, you know, I got to reset your sights in the tag team titles while you're focused on the Money in the Bank ladder match. I agree. Does she really have to be going for the belt next week and in the ladder match? I don't think so. I mean, if she was that good, then maybe, but she's not. So I thought that was questionable. The highlight of the night for me was the Sonya Deville, Mandy Rose face-off. Sonya went to town here on Mandy Rose. Get your mind out of the gutter first and foremost. But I thought on the mic, Sonya really shined. We really haven't had many chances to hear Sonya talk before. I like Sonya. I like Mandy Rose a little more, but Sonya is also very, very good. I've seen a lot of divided opinions on, oh, Mandy Rose is the bigger star, or Sonya's a lot better. There's really not one clear-cut, oh, one's better than the other. I think both are terrific. Sonya really showed here that she is a great talker, and maybe part of that was the fact that Mandy and her are legitimately best friends. They, they feel comfortable with each other. They know all about each other. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe they'll put Sonya in a talking segment with, uh, you know, Bailey at some point, and she'll flop. But I thought here, she was awesome. I thought this was the best part of the show by far, and that includes an awesome Daniel Bryan Cesaro match. That's how good this was. Sonya brought up about how, oh, the Fire and Desire tag team is all about you. Even when we made our entrance, you know, that she brought up the magazine that, that Mandy Rose was on the cover of, and they were handing out the magazine that Mandy Rose was on the cover of. Not Sonya. It was all about Mandy Rose. Even during their entrance, they would always come out to Mandy's entrance theme, and Sonya would always be blurred out. I thought that was a great attention to detail. I don't know if they did that with the idea in their head of like, oh, we're going to split them up at some point. We can use that as fuel. I don't know if that's always been the plan, but they've been doing that forever. That's not a new thing. They've always been blurring out Sonya's face in the fire and desire entrance. So she made a lot of good points here. A lot of good points here. And that's usually what makes the best heels that they have logic to their argument. Mandy Rose, that was good here too. I thought she was all right. And the acting, I thought was... Excellent. At a time in WWE where the acting usually isn't all that good, uh, recently, I thought the promos have been amazing, specifically on Raw. But in this segment, the acting, 
I mean, like, for example, the Alexa Bliss, Nikki Cross, when they were backing away in fear, I th- the, the, the acting was atrocious. Here, I thought it was great. I thought even Dolph was good. Otis was great selling his frustration and aggression coming to the aid of Mandy Rose. This whole thing was awesome. So Dolph comes out. He's like, oh, I really care about you, Mandy. If you really feel something for me, like, now is the time to say it. And he puts his arm on her shoulder. And I'm like, why is she allowing him to do that? In any realistic situation, if you don't feel anything for a guy and you're supposed to have a boyfriend and Otis... Why are you letting Why are you letting this other man who manipulated you touch you? And sp- thankfully, she was like, "Get away from me!" And she smacked his hand away. And that's when Sonya leapt, you know, leapt right on her and uh, pounced. I guess is the right word I was looking for. She pounced right on top of her, started brawling with her, beating her up. And Dolph's like, "Oh, what are you doing? You're messing up the plan." Blah blah blah. This whole thing was great. Otis comes out, lays out Dolph. Dolph goes back into the end of the segment, gets laid out again, which that was funny. Uh, Otis was awesome here. I love Otis. I love this whole storyline. I thought this was a great way to progress that storyline. And I would have to imagine, hopefully at the pay-per-view, and they don't do it next week or whatever, they do Otis and Mandy versus Sonya and Dolph. And I could see them doing Mandy and Sonya on an upcoming episode of SmackDown. That would be fine. But I thought Sonya's... You, you kind of had to see it coming. It's Wrestling 101. But Sonya's transformation in this one segment from going from, oh, I'm really sad, how could you you know, not return my calls after everything we've been through together to, like, a completely vindictive bitch I thought was absolutely amazing. Two thumbs up for this segment from yours truly. They kept it going with the Daniel Bryan, Cesaro, Money in the Bank qualifier. The outcome was never in doubt, but they got a ton of time. Very good match. Uh, Daniel Bryan wins, of course, advancing to the Money in the Bank ladder match. The only thing I didn't like about this match was a minor nitpick. At the end there, Nakamura attempted to interfere when Daniel Bryan had Cesaro in the yes lock, Gulak thwarted the interference, allowed Daniel Bryan to win on his own. What I don't understand is, was that if Nakamura did indeed get in the ring and hit Daniel Bryan, then wouldn't he have won anyway? Daniel Bryan still would have qualified, so who cares? In any other situation, I would be like, okay, he doesn't want to lose, tap out, blah, 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 I get it. But here it's like, okay, we know that whoever wins goes to Money in the Bank. Maybe the idea was, okay, if Nakamura interferes, the referee would get distracted. Maybe that's what they would be going for. I'm not exactly sure. But it looked like if Nakamura got in the ring and attacked Daniel Bryan, then he would have won anyway. So what was even the point, you know? But I thought this was a good match. Daniel Bryan wins and headed to the Money in the Bank match. Or the Money in the Bank ladder match, that is. I should talk about the Money in the Bank ladder match in a second, but real quickly, we got two qualifiers on tap for next week. We have King Corbin, who was seen attacking Elias on this episode for what felt like forever. It felt longer than the Edge and Randy Orton match at WrestleMania, and that's saying something. Um, I wasn't really that big of a fan of that segment, just because I really do not give a shit about seeing King Corbin and Elias continue. I figured they were building to an Elias, or I'm sorry, a Money in the Bank qualifier between the two. And they're not, because King Corbin is facing Drew Gulak next week. I assume King Corbin wins. I would like Gulak to be in there, but I assume King Corbin, he's the bigger star, former Money in the Bank winner. He should probably win, not the ladder match, but win the qualifier. But Elias should be in there too. Elias should be in that ladder match. After winning at WrestleMania, it would be completely pointless if Corbin got in the Money in the Bank ladder match and Elias didn't despite beating Corbin at WrestleMania. What a fucking waste. So I don't know who Elias would face, probably like Nakamura or something like that. But he should win. He also should advance to the Money in the Bank ladder match. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say? They announced um, for next week, like I said, the Bray Wyatt, Braun Strowman revisiting of their history segment, which is cool. They promoted something else, too. Um, the other Jeff Hardy video package, the third part of his ongoing series of video packages, which is cool. I, oh, the women's tag team title match, which I mentioned earlier. Oh, and the Money in the Bank ladder match, so... Well, they also announced on this show a rumor that was making the rounds right before SmackDown went on the air. It was reported by PW Insider, and it was confirmed on SmackDown that this year's Money in the Bank ladder matches, okay, will be filmed not from the PC. And I'm sure the show will take place at the PC, but the two ladder matches themselves will take place at the WWE headquarters here in Connecticut, in Stamford, Connecticut. What's happening is, as explained by Corey Graves, the competitors, I'm not sure if they're six or eight, probably six, uh, because they are doing, they did the three women's qualifiers on Raw this week. They're doing three more for the men next week. 
So unless they're holding more like the week after that, like one qualifier for the men and women, I don't think we're getting eight people in the ladder match, which it is technically a ladder match. So what's going on is they're starting on the bottom floor of the building and they have to work their way up the corporate ladder, so to speak, as they're calling it, which is, I think is clever, a, a clever tagline for the match. They have to work their way up to the, to the roof of the building where I believe ladders will still be there and they have to, they, I don't know where the freaking briefcase would be hanging from on the roof, assuming that's where they're going. That's what it depicted on the posters. That's where I'm getting that from. And that's where the ladder match will resume. So I, I find this concept completely crazy yet in, incredibly cool. I like it. It's something different. They're trying something different. It screams WCW circa the 90s, the mid 90s, late 90s. But you know what? Fuck it. Why not? It's something different. There's no, there's no crowd. So why the hell not? This is the only time you would ever be able to do something like this. So I, I say, I say good. I say this is cool. So why the hell not? Uh, we'll see how it goes. It could be a complete train wreck, a total disaster, but we won't know until it happens. So we'll, we'll see. It could be just a lot like Edge and Orton where it drags on and on and on and on. If they get creative with it, I think it could be a lot of fun. So we'll see how it goes. We get to the main event of this show for the SmackDown Tag Team titles. This not, despite not being an actual tag team match, a triple threat match for the titles, pitting Big E against The Miz and Jey Uso. So Miz and Morrison were the champions going in. I understood why they did it at WrestleMania because Miz was uh, sick reportedly. Couldn't make the show or he was you know turned away, sent home, whatever. So they did Morrison, Jimmy Uso, and Kofi. Okay. And it was a good match. I mean, they made the most of it. I thought it was a good ladder match. Uh, no crowd sucked, but, you know, it was still a very good match. At the same time, with this show, um, there was no reason to do a standard triple threat match. Now, if they want to do Big E, Miz, and Jey Uso on, you know, as a normal match, I think that's fine. Unless they can't do six people in the same place at the same time, which, if they announce another match for Money in the Bank between the three teams, then obviously that's bullshit. I, I, I could maybe see that being a reason, as to why they would do a standard match for the tag team titles, um, for for you know a, a regular triple threat, but if they do all three teams together in the same ring at the same time at the pay per view, then I really don't understand how much sense that makes. So I thought the match was good. I would not have changed the championships. Miz and Morrison have only been champions for like a month and a half, if that, maybe two months. I I know they've already beaten every other team in that division. They won the Elimination Chamber. They won at Super Showdown. They won at WrestleMania. How much more they can do, I I get it. I get it. But if anything, if they were going to change the championships, and I will say, they did pay tribute to Howard Finkel on the show. I thought the video package was great. Um, Big E, I thought it said Finn. I'm like, why is he paying tribute to Finn Balor? Someone watching with us, Alexis's brother who was watching with us, had to point out, it said Fink. Like Howard Finkel, obviously. Big E was very close with him, so I think that's cool that he paid tribute to him on his armband. Maybe they weren't going to change the cha- they weren't going to change the championships, but they did for Fink because he was paying tribute to Fink and so they could also do the and no, you know, the patented Howard Finkel announcement which I can't do to save my own life. But maybe they did it for that reason which I put in the title of this video of course, and how could I not to pay tribute to the late great Howard Finkel. Uh, if if they were going to do that and they wanted the whole and no SmackDown Tag Team Champions, have it be the Usos. At least they haven't held... I mean, yeah, they're multi-time tag team champions as well. And they've held the belts, what, six, seven times? Over the last four or five years? Six years? At least they haven't been champions in over a year. The last time they were tag team champions was when they were on SmackDown. I mean, they went to Raw. They went for the belts a few times. They never won them. Then they took time off for a while. They were SmackDown tag team champions right after WrestleMania. They actually retained the belts at WrestleMania... And then they lost them to the Hardy Boys on the subsequent SmackDown. And they have not held gold since then. Big E and Kofi, on the other hand, were literally just SmackDown Tag Team Champions the other week. Uh, the other month, I'm sorry. Back in February. They were SmackDown Tag Team Champions up until late February when they dropped them to Miz and Morrison. Before that, they had lost them to the Revival back at the Clash of Champions pay-per-view. They regained them in November. Before that, they were champions back in the summer. They were champions back in July of last year. They've held the belts now three times in the span of one year. So all this not, which I completely agree with, by the way, all this talk about, oh, Charlotte Flair, she's got to break her father's record. It's complete bullshit. They keep putting belts on her for the sake of putting belts on her. 
Listen, I totally agree. And the New Day have had better reigns than Charlotte, but you can't complain about Charlotte getting all these reigns and then not complain about the New Day, who have always held the tag team titles. Three championship runs in one year is completely ridiculous. And yeah, their tag team division is not the deepest, but unless the idea is, oh, we're putting the belts on them to ultimately lose, to have them lose the belts, the, for, the fucking Forgotten Sons which is absolutely terrible. There is really no upside in my opinion. Yeah, New Day are entertaining. There is no reason for them to be smacked on tag team champions again at this point. Zero. I have less than zero interest in seeing the forgotten freaking sons against the New Day for the tag team titles. No thank you. Miz and Morrison, at least you could do them and the Usos. That's a fresh view. Their match on SmackDown right after Elimination Chamber or right after Super Showdown before Elimination Chamber, was great. They had a great match. You know, that's a fresh feud. They could do them in Heavy Machinery at some point. That's a fresh feud. The New Day versus Miz and Morrison again really isn't that fresh. Just, I don't know. I, I really didn't like this. I thought the match itself was good. I think there's a lot of issues with putting the belt right back on the New Day. It's not fresh at all. They were just the tag team champions two months ago, less than two months ago. So again, you can't complain about Charlotte and then say, oh, an eighth reign for the New Day, like, well-deserved. Like, dude, there's there's no reason for them to be champions right now. Absolutely zero. Take time off, or maybe not take time off, but utilize them in a singles capacity. The mid-card division on the show needs help. If they're not going to put Morrison and Miz back in, like, the singles ranks for a while, then have Miz and Kofi, or have Kofi and Big E in the singles ranks. Kofi's a freaking former WWE champion, for God's sakes. Have him feud with Sheamus. Have him feud with Sami Zayn. Not Miz and Morrison again. Why would I want to see Kofi and Big E as tag team champions again at this point? Just not a fan. I thought it was a good match. Just very... A lot of questionable booking decisions on the show. Between this, Tamina advance, or, you know, her facing Bailey at the pay-per-view, Dana Brooke beating Naomi. A lot of questionable decisions. Not a totally terrible show, though. I thought Sheamus is, uh... Little thing with Jeff Hardy was well done. I thought the Otis and Sonya and Dolph and uh, Mandy segment was great. I thought Brian and Cesaro had a really, really good match. The moment of bliss shit was, was it was exactly that. It was shit. It was terrible. But you know they did. They, I, I like the idea of a Bray and Braun feud. But as I said earlier, to go full circle here, it's way too soon. So we'll see what they have in mind for these two at the pay per view next week on SmackDown. I will be back next week with my thoughts on the April twenty fourth edition of SmackDown. So stay tuned for that. Until then, guys, have a great rest of your weekend. Be sure to like this video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. Tomorrow should be my review, if I'm not mistaken, of the WWE Break It Down episode on Ricochet, which is actually going up tomorrow. So if I can watch it in time, review it in time, that should be up tomorrow. If not, it'll likely be some random miscellaneous video. So stay tuned for that. And uh, in the meantime, guys, have a great one. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.